Aloha. Hey, it's Julie Zemelis, 365 Hawaii and Real Broker. And we are here to talk about the August housing market for the Big Island of Hawaii and with a mortgage update so you guys can figure out what's happening with the money. And uh, we've got a great uh, group of realtors from all over the island with us today. Um, I'm going to introduce them. Uh, we have Eric Zemelis, who is going to be bringing us the West Hawaii uh, update, and Delania Branham, who is going to be talking about West Hawaii neighborhoods. Uh, we've got Jana Mahoney. Uh, Keller Williams and um, uh, Delaney and, and Erica with Real Broker. Um, and she's going to be talking about what's happening in Waikoloa, Waikoloa Village, um, North Hawaii, including Javi today. And then we also have Andy Madrid, Keller Williams, and he's going to be talking about what's going on in South Hawaii. Um, and then we have uh, a new guest today. We have Travis Green with Guild Mortgage, and he's going to be giving us our mortgage update. Um, and then uh, we are going to be taking questions. We have a couple of people here joining us today. Thank you very much for coming with us today on this uh traipse through the whole Hawaii real estate market experience. So um, let us start with Eric. And as we go through the Kona experience, and then we'll come up around the coast and around the island. So Eric, can you tell us a little bit about what is going on with the market? I sure can. So let's start with just kind of rolling in from an island view and kind of getting down to Kona. Uh, Island-wide, there were 275 new listings this month, and in 2023, there were 230, so it's up. And our sold listings, we had 181 sold in July, uh, island-wide again, and here, in, uh, and 155 was uh, 2023. So we are moving up, things are picking up real estate waves from last year, and last year was slow to stay that. On the condo side, uh, we had 91 new listings, and 57 were for last uh, 2023. Um, and sold where we had 51 sold in 2024 and 47 uh, in 2023. So then let us move on here and uh, let us talk about in Kona uh, for residential. We had, uh, uh, let's see, we had 41 sales this month. And uh, one year ago, uh, it was 28 sales. So we had a 46% uh, increase since last year. So doing pretty good there. And then, um, yeah, let's see here, in condos, uh, we had uh, 32 sales this year, and last year we had 23 for a 39% increase. So things are worse moving. And then I'm moving over here to pricing is what we're going to do next. Um, and uh, our Julie, what do you think the median price was for the uh, 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 Kona on the residential? Uh, it probably has gone up. It used to be one three. It's probably one four or five it's a big number it's even bigger than that one million five hundred and forty eight thousand for the uh for for this month for uh, now remember that is affected by you know the number of sales and some crazy high things so it it, it can vary quite a bit uh last year it was 960 uh, last year this time it was 967 thousand so that's a 60 percent increase in one year and again I it'll not believe <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't seem that way does it things it like seems like might be slowing down a little bit um all right. So then on condominiums, um, our uh, median sales price was uh, 750000 And uh, last year at this time, it was 575000 for a 30% uh, increase in there. So we've got some definitely things are moving. And I'm seeing if I have any other stats that might be, I'm borrowing these, Lance is usually supposed to be these numbers, so I'm borrowing a stat. So I'm kind of seeing what I've got. So those oh, are the numbers. secrets. They can, What's they that? Oh, sorry. <laughs> You're but, the intelligent realtor that draws the stats. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will next time. Uh, so anyway, so those are our stats on uh, the Kona side to give you guys an idea what's going on. There we go. Okay. Okay. And uh, with a fresh outlook and fresh numbers, uh, Delania Branham, uh, tell us a little bit about what you're doing. Now for the new people, what Delania adds to this, because she's also a uh, expert realtor here in West White, um, to make it so that you guys can understand a little bit more about what happens with market trends, Delania is actually focusing on three neighborhoods and she's been doing this for a while. So Delania, tell them a little bit about what neighborhoods you're focusing on and, uh, you know, year over year, you're, 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 you've been doing it long enough now to kind of get a year over year. Yeah, I think we, uh, we actually started as about two years ago. Um, so we've got some pretty good data here. And we do, so we do two residential and one apartment um, condo. The residentials, we do Pululani Estates and Lokahi Makai. The main reason we choose those two is because there's a lot of like properties. So when you look at prices, you're not comparing apples to zucchini, you're comparing apples to apples to maybe a, a rare orange in there. And then um, <laughs> same with a condo, we use Elite Ilani. It's a there's, it's been around for a long time. It's high density. So we get a lot of sales data from that one. 
um, and it's a pretty mid range. You're not a, it's not an oceanfront high end condo, so it's kind of the good um, marker of what the condo market does. So, looking at what we did, so I'm going to go through the last two months, June and July, starting with Pulani Estates. There were three active listings, or there's currently three active listings. Um, there's one for 995,000. It's been on the market 120 days, no mm. price reductions. There is one for 1,039,000. It's been on the market 114 days, no price reductions. And then one for 1,049,000. It's been on the market for 12 days, no price reductions. Um, so, you know, sellers are kind of just sitting with, I think sellers they're hanging, feel like they're hanging a, on to those prices. It, they're like, it's a slow market. Let's hang in there. Let's see what's happened. And there's always variables. For instance, the one for 995, they have a tenant in there with a, a bit of a lease. So they're not in a big rush. You know, they've got to wait out that lease. So there's always sometimes, you know, outside factors that that um, will influence the seller. There's nothing under contract currently in that um, in that neighborhood. There was one sale in the last two months. It sold for one million twenty five thousand. It was on the market for eighty four days, and it sold for twenty four thousand under asking. Huh. So not a lot of activity. And you know, speaking to past history, if I go back, why? Just out of curiosity. So it looks like a year ago, July August, there were three sales in that same neighborhood: nine hundred and seventy five thousand, one million forty five thousand, one million eighty. So, you know, it's staying pretty consistent. If you go back even further, when we first started doing this, mm -hmm. sales were early 2021. They were selling in that neighborhood between 690,000 and 810. So in the last three years, prices have gotten, I mean, you remember probably like maybe 18 months ago, they started to peak to a million. Now they're hitting over a million. Yeah. They're kind of staying in that range. So, you know, market keeps going up and it's kind of hanging out regardless of all those external factors. Yeah. And then the beginning, remember when we talked about um, when we were first coming into uh, 2024, um, that the pundits had said that the uh, housing oh, yeah. market would remain flat in terms of price. Yeah. And so that's what we're kind of what we're seeing. Yeah. It's, it, you know, there's little bumps, but yeah, it's, it's not really, we're not being affected by too much. It's kind of just, it's hanging in there. And so we'll see what happens. The rates drop, you know, will it pick up even more? Yeah. Um, going on to Ali Ilani. Now this that's is a story. <laughs> that, but, and I know we talked about this a little bit. So currently, it, right now, there are 11 active listings in uh, Ali Ilani. There's one double unit that I don't count because it's a real outlier. Um, they're listed between 480,000 and 598,000. The two highest are the three bedrooms. The rest are all two bedrooms. Mm -hmm. And that seems like a lot. And I know there's a lot of talk about the rising insurance rates, but April and May, there were seven active listings in that complex, um, priced right in the same range. So were they getting affected by the insurance rates that early? Or is it just we're having a couple of busy months? Because if I look back, if I go scroll back through the past few months prior to April, one listing, two listing, four listings. So I, there's I, no reason. Yeah. I have a thought on this one. Did they... Yeah. Um... Did the people know that the, that the that the increase was coming and put it on the market? Did they before? know it was coming? Yeah, it's, yeah because, as early as it was, it, it was circulating before that. You know, yeah, what was yeah. going? Yeah. So that's the question. Did people know in April? Is that why we have so much activity in last month and then this month, or is it just? Um, at and any rate, we, so there's that's a, one of the yeah. that's one of the things we're talking about after we do all this thing. We're all going to have a little chat about the uh, insurance. Insurance. Fund. Can you, can, Adelina, can you tell them, do you know how much the HOA went up, uh, uh, you know, roughly so people get an idea what's going on with it? It's uh, it's in the eights now, right? Uh, it went up, it's, from my understanding, went up about $250 per per unit. Per unit. Um, but depending on what two bedrooms, what I'm referring it to. It used to be one of the lowest. Let me see if I can. Yeah, I mean, it used to be one of the lower um, HOAs around. So let's see. It still might after everybody else's goes up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, two bedroom right now. The HOA is 679. So yeah, so it was, I think it was in the four or five. So it probably went up around 200,000. So that's not outrageous compared to some of the rate increases. And actually that at 679, it's still lower than a lot of other. Like the ocean front condos, yeah. 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 yeah, a lot of them. 
Um, so there are four under contract. So of those previous chunk, a few of them went under contract and there were no sales since um, May. No sales since May? No sales since May. Couple of four under contract. So those will probably be closing in the next, probably, they'll close this month. So those will show up in the next report. Um, Got one closing so, day. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> do you have one in there? You have one, right, Jenna? Yeah, yeah, that's good. Um, so, Jenna, do you know when they found out about the um, insurance? No, they've known for a while. They have known for a while. So that probably is part of the reason people are starting to ditch those. Yeah. yeah. Um, moving down into Lokahi Makai, that is the neighborhood that's a little bit north of Kona. Again, very much like Polani Estates, very similar houses. Um, it's a nice basis for us to look at. Not as much activity as pool on these dates generally. Over June and July, there are, currently there's two active listings, one for 969,000. It's been on the market 71 days, no price reductions. There's another one listed for 1.275, which is very high for the neighborhood. Um, they tend to cap out around a million, maybe a million one. Most hover around 900,000 in there. So that's it does have a pool. It does have owned photovoltaic system, but it's it's high. So it'll be interesting to see. It's just been on been on eight, eight days. It's already had a twenty thousand dollar price reduction. Ah, oh, eight days. So, so they came in at what almost one point three. They've already dropped it. So it'll be interesting to see activity on that one because they're they're pretty high up um, compared to the rest of the, you know the size, the age, everything else is consistent with the rest of the neighborhood. So um, that's a big chunk. There are two under contract and there was one sale over June and July. It was sold for 939,000. It's on the market for 11 days. It sold for 24,000 under asking and that was a cash sale. So they probably were happy to sell it after almost two weeks. Yeah, take the money and run. Um, yeah, so that's your spotlight. Okay, good job, good job. Okay, so we're going up the coast to Jana. Um, I'm gonna put the other place spotlight on you. There you are. Oh, unmute myself. Um, okay. So we did have a question in the comments. I noticed, um, is, is the insurance going up for single family residential homes? And the answer is yes, it is. Uh, it's not just the condos. It's the, the insurance on residential are going up as well. Yeah. And then I can, no, I can add to that, but okay. the difference is the residential is not going up anywhere close to what the condo associations have gone up. Yeah. And uh, uh, Tara, thank you for asking that question. Um, like, again, um, because this is a big issue that's affecting Hawaii um, and Florida and the rest of the world, um, we're going to have a, a little bit of, you know, of more information about what's going on with the uh, insurance rates and who's being affected the most and all that kind of stuff after we do the round robin, because it, it is, it's a big thing, especially if you're trying to buy in West Hawaii, it seems. Um, okay. So uh, Jenna, go for it. So one thing I want to say about that too is in the HOA, you have the HOA has its own insurance and then the owner has insurance. So basically you've got your insurance going up in two different places. Mm. On cover the inside of the, um, the right. stuff inside. Yeah. The yeah. Okay. So okay. Waikoloa Village um, is a residential neighborhood that's about six miles uh, Malka of the beaches, which means uphill um, and Basically, the, the prettiest beaches in the world were six miles away. There's about 7,000 residents here, but it's growing very quickly. We are getting some new um, complexes that are going in. We're getting some new construction going in. So that 7,000 is a is a moving target for sure. So there were um, 24 active listings today. And um, price range went from 670, which is a fixer upper for sure to 2 million wet 2 million wet 85 which is brand new construction very nice very high end and it, they're not even completed yet so if you bought the 2 million 185 you would be um, able to choose some of your finishes and they've got the gorgeous ocean views it's kind of the new area of sunset ridge where the 2 million 185 is um, average days on market right now is 105 um last month there were 11 that were sold from 525 to a million 350. And again, the one for 525,000, that's a fixer. So you just have to know if you see something in the village for 525,000, it's a fixer upper. For no, wait, sure. wait, tell them like, what, how really what that, that level is that you're going to get a fixer. 
anything under seven? Probably, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so I mean, I don't think there's a deal. There's the it's a good reason. But if it starts with the five, it's for sure a fixer. It okay. just is. Um, it comes with a squatter. <laughs> Julie and I know about that. We've seen seen a, a home in Waikoloa Village that had a squatter, and it was a nightmare. Um, average days on market of the ones that sold last month in July was 72 days. Um, compare that to the ones that sold in July of 2023. The days on market was 27 days. Wow. So they're staying on the market a lot longer now in Waikoloa Village. And um, another thing that's pretty interesting is the original price to the list price is 95.58. So it's kind of holding on. It was 93% in 2023, with, but there were only two sales. So, you know, when you only have two sales, it kind of is difficult to rely on those statistics because they're pretty meaningless. You know, we don't have the, the numbers that some of the other, you know, uh, complexes have. And in Waikoloa Village for condos, we have 20 active listings right now uh, that range from 397, 750 to 595. Average days on market is 66. Five units in Fairway Terrace, three in Ali Milani, seven in Waikoloa Hills, three in Waikoloa Villas, and two in Makanakai. So that's kind of how they're distributed throughout, throughout the complex. Um, sold last month. Uh, we had three, so not a lot. Four twenty to seven ninety nine days on market thirty. Original to list ninety eight percent. Compared to twenty twenty three, there were four uh, from three eighty nine to four fifty nine days on market twenty five and original to list. So we're kind of doing almost the same thing in twenty twenty four that we did in twenty twenty three. There's not a huge difference in what's going on as far as that goes. Uh, with condos. So it's pretty active because, you know, 20, 20 current listings, that's, that's a pretty active market from, from where it's been. We haven't, we're having more and more things come on the market. Um, so now let's talk about Monolani residential. Um, you know, Monolani is, is in the same TMK as Waikoloa village, but it's downhill or Mackay. And so, you know, you have all the resort amenities. So you're going to have like, there's two golf courses down there. Um, of course, they have their own private beach club, which is really a nice beach. Um, they have a shopping center there with restaurants and um, also some cultural sites, which is pretty cool. There's like fish ponds down there and some petroglyphs. So it's got a lot, a lot going for it in Montelani. There are eight listings right now in residential and they go from 4.6 million to 32 million and the average days on market is 219 which you always expect when you get into these higher end houses they just stay on the market longer um the 32 million is at black sand beach it's seven bedrooms eight and a half bathrooms 6,300 square feet 1.4 acres with just stunning ocean views off the mountain so it's a pretty incredible property. Um, last month, zero sold. Zero. Um, July of 2023, one sold for $5.5 million. It was on the market zero days and sold at 100% list. So, boom, it came on and somebody bought it. Um, and, and you see that a lot of times in the luxury market. Sometimes if somebody's watching for something specifically, they'll, you know, they don't last very long. Um so let's see, Monolani condos now, there are 21. So that's that's a nice number of condos. And they range from a million two sixty nine to three million eight fifty. The one that's a million two sixty nine seems like a screaming deal to me. Um, just because you don't see that price point a lot in Monolani. Mm -hmm. Uh K Kailani has the three million eight fifty listing. It has that that complex only has 10 buildings and they're all duplexes. So there's only 20 units. Mm -hmm. It's gated. It's very nice. Camilo has two. Montelani Point has two. Islands has one. Palm Villas has one. Kulalani has four. Um, Montelani Terrace has three. And Fairways has five. And mm -hmm. the, the least expensive one is, is, a, is a two bedroom in Fairways. It's a really good floor plan. Um, that one won't last long. So um, 
you know, that's that's a pretty that's a pretty vibrant condo market, I think, too, in Montalani. Now, let's move to the Waikoloa Resort, which is a different TMK, um, a little bit further north of Montalani. And it's got seven residential properties right now, and six of those are in Puaco. They range from 2599 to 28 million, and the average days on market is 156. Zero sold in July. July 2023, one sold. So again, that, you know, in the in those higher prices, they stay on the market a little bit longer. Um, you know, properties in this area tend to be more expensive and and it just takes longer to sell those luxury properties. So if you are looking for a property in there, we can put you on a drip so that you get first one. So the ones that come up that are a really good price, like the one that sold in zero days at 100% of list, um, that person was probably sitting there waiting mm -hmm. for one of those properties to come up. And well, just we had that meeting. person that we had that person, we had a person looking for something too. And I gave it to Jana and she was like, every time something came up, do you want it? Do you want it? And finally he said, yes, I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Cause some people have in mind like specific buildings within a condo complex that they want because they have an ocean view or they're close to the amenities or whatever. So you know, it, that's that's pretty easy. We also sent letters out to all those people that had condos in the spot that they wanted. So um, the Waikoloa Resort condos have 33 right now. So that is a lot of condos. And they range from 960 to 3,975 with an average days on market of 80 days. So um, Vistas 3, Colony Villas 7, Fairway Villas 6, Waikoloa Beach Villas, two, Hali'i Kai has four, and Kolea has 11. Hmm. Yeah, so a lot of, a lot of um, Kolea right now. What's happening with the HOA fees there? I wonder if there's oh, I'm, Probably, I'm sure the same thing that's happening everywhere. Yeah, just saying, um, get it out. There were six that sold last month with 57 days on market average and 98%. So they're not coming off list a lot down in Waikoloa Resort for condos. Last year, um, 85 days with 91%. So it's gotten a little better as far as that goes. Um, okay. And then the, the next group I ran was Kohala by the Sea, Kohala Kai, Kohala Ranch, and Kohala Waterfront. These are four neighborhoods that are north. Um, oh, kind of where you turn right at Kauai High and then start going towards Havi. They're all right in that area. So they all have spectacular ocean views. They're all really nice. Not a lot of inventories in those neighborhoods. Right now in all four of those neighborhoods, there's only four, uh, sorry, seven active listings. And they range from 2.1 to 3.9. And average days on the market, 67. One sold in July um, of this year uh, on the market, 180 days. One sold last July. Uh, was only on the market three days. And I do have a client who bought a lot in Kohala Ranch a couple of years ago and is building there. And it took two years to get a permit. Yeah, that's what I've heard. And we're, we're going on about one year now for construction. So it's going to be three years to get in that house. So um, there are some, uh, some lots available for sale in there for sure. But you can't go into it thinking, you know, like on the mainland, we're going to get a house built in six months, that's not going to happen here. No, you know, almost anywhere. <laughs> yeah. Three years. It's going to take three years. Um, and I think that some condo complexes are a little harder to get approved because you have to get it approved by the HOA first. Then you turn around and get it approved by the county. And sometimes the HOA is harder than the county, which is probably the case with Kohala by the Sea. So um, one last month, one last year. And um, so that's what's happening at Kohala by the Sea. Now, I wanted to talk about Javi quickly because I know we we don't normally do that, but there's some cool stuff going on out there. It's on the very northern tip of Hawaii Island, and it's the cutest little town. It's got restaurants and lots and lots of art galleries and a nice farmer's market. It's just a cute little town. It's kind of um a drive like when you would have to plan all your costco yeah. purchases <laughs> for for one trip because you can't just zip down there 
and um, like you can from Waikoloa, but it's 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 really a cool little town. It used to be kind of where the hub of the sugar cane industry. So you've got some really cool stuff up there. You got the Pololu Valley Lookout. You've got the King Kamehameha statue, and it's just it's just fun. And right now there's five active listings there from 850 to 7 million 490 with 113 days on average. And the house that's 7 million 490,000 is a compound that used to be owned by the Coast Guard. So you've got how many? Four separate three bedroom, two bath houses that are kind of lined up in this compound and it's all gated. Um, and it's all been remodeled. It's got battery backups. It's just kind of, if anybody out there wants to buy a compound, there you go. And it's right on the ocean. So you could just scuba dive and snorkel right off your property, uh, <laughs> like the trails and stuff. So that is it for Kohala. I did run HPP since I knew Amber was not going to be here. If you want me to pull those up real quick. Well, can you give them kind of like just a, a brush on what's going on? Sure, uh, sure, sure, people, sure. If you guys want like a a, um, a neighborhood by neighborhood uh, update on what's going on, um, you can look at what Amber uh, did um, about two weeks ago in terms of what was happening. But uh, Jan, just kind of give them an idea real quick of what HPP is the largest um, and most active uh, uh, neighborhood in uh, East White. Yes, it's 15 square miles with 8,800 one acre lots. So it's huge. It's a huge neighborhood. And right now there are 70, 70 houses that are actively listed and they go from 175,000 to a million 630. And um, I did filter out anything. I think it's all Lava Zone 3, but just to be on the safe side, I filtered out everything one and two and I put all fee simple and um, 70 listings came up, which is a lot. It's very lush and tropical there. And so you've got these one acre lots and um, sometimes people have the whole acre cleared and sometimes they just have the part where the house is. So, you know, there's all, all kinds of things there. It's um, 20 minutes from 20, 30 minutes from Hilo, depending on where you are in the neighborhood. And um, some of the roads are not paved. So I just think that's kind of a, a thing to think about. But average days on market there is 89. Um, and last month, there were 25 that closed and they range from 179.9 to 2 million 99. Um, average was 574. So that's, you know, I, I keep seeing new construction over there. I keep seeing the ads from the realtors with new construction that are right in that range. Mm -hmm. And um, seems like a pretty good deal. And uh, days on market of the ones that sold last month was 60. And sale to original price was 94.5. Okay. Well, the last is uh, Amber. I like to say uh, that's a six percent sale on housing in East Hawaii. So, uh, <laughs> right, right. Yeah, so, if you're looking for new construction under six hundred, that's a good place to go and look for it. It really so, is. Yeah. It really is. So, okay, thanks, Jen. Um, okay, so let's go over to our buddy uh, Andy. He's got uh, the entire southern section of the island. Uh, there you go. Yeah. So tell him, tell him your service area. So pretty much I, well, my service area is pretty much South Kona to South Hilo. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hundreds of miles. No. <laughs> yeah, lots. But, you know, I live in the district of Ka'u, the lower west side of the island, about an hour south of Kona. The, the undiscovered gem of the island. Yeah. So that's where my market update is. So it's a little bit different. It's a lot different than what Jan has been giving you and what Julie <laughs> will talk to you about because... It's one of the lowest priced neighborhoods on the island um, right now. So there's, I separated between land and houses because a lot of people looking looking for something inexpensive. They're like, well, I want to buy land and build. But like, okay, we'll help you do that. Um, right now, there are 242 active land listings for sale. In um, that would be all of basically Kau, which would be um, Ocean View, Ocean View Ranchos, uh, Kulakai View Estates, and Kona Garden. Those are the, the bars. I didn't, I separated the South Point out of that. So just in those neighborhoods alone, and the majority of those are in Hawaiian Ocean View Estates, which is on the Malka side of the highway. Mm -hmm. Those are all one acre lots. Primarily, there are some that are a little bit larger, like mine's 1.9 acres, but pretty much they're all one acre lots. 
um, 242 active listings, priced between $9,000 and $373,000, with the average price being $47,849. Average days on market is 168. That would be for vacant land. So if you're looking to land on the island and you know put your own stamp on it, you can buy some land cheap and homestead. As far as residential properties go, there are 50 on the market today, um, 50, 50 properties. These are gonna be a combination of permitted properties and unpermitted properties. Mm -hmm. We have a whole video that talks about unpermitted <laughs> properties. $78,800 to shockingly $950,000. That is shocking. Yeah, for, for this area, yeah. Average price point, $357,077. Average days on market, 107. So not a whole lot longer than, than neighborhoods like HPP. Mm -hmm. Sales price, sales price ratio, 98.25%. So, oh, so they're getting what they want. They're getting what they want. There are 15 pending sales right now between $89,500 and $649,000. Mm -hmm. uh, average days on market for those have been 117. So we're seeing that days on market trickle down a little bit. Um, sold properties. In the last six months, we had 48 sales uh, between uh, 47000 and $800,000. So they had 875 was the list sold for 870 or 800. Let me, yeah. let me, what house looks like that? Is that like a mini mansion that they it'll be, it'll be a big house that has a pool. Yeah. This one thing about this neighborhood is you you get really panoramic ocean views. For 875, you're going to be in the ranchos typically. Uh -huh. uh, you're on three acres because the, the ranchos, Kona Garden, and Kulakai View Estates are all three acre properties. Oh, okay. So you get more land. Right, Kona, Guard, or Kona Gardens and Kulakai View Estates are gated entry, so you have access. You need access key to get in them. Oh, okay, security's the pretty, good. The security's pretty good. They change the gate gate codes like every sixty days. You know, that's they awesome. Gate codes. Okay. That's kind of interesting. Um, so yeah, big variation on highest price to lowest price because we're, you know, we have so many properties that are are unpermitted. You know. So the next neighborhood, so that's Kau. That's I mean, so that's the Ocean View area. You know, we've got some markets. We've got three gas stations in the neighborhood. Yeah, we have a hardware store. Like I said, grocery stores. Um, there's a business center. There's kind of a lot happening. It's sort of you know, equidistant. It's sort of like the stopping point between if you're driving from Kona to Hilo. That's sort of the middle point of the road, pretty much. A lot of people will stop here to eat or something, grab coffee on their way to the Hawaii Volcanoes National Park. So then the next neighborhood down will be on the south end of the island in the South Point area. You have three major neighborhoods there. You have Mark Twain Estates, mm -hmm. Discovery Harbor, and the Green Sands uh, subdivision. There are 24 properties for sale right now in that neighborhood between 180,000 and 1.1 million dollars. Uh, average days on market 102, average price point 595, 240. Um, in escrow, we have 15 properties for sale or 15 properties under contract now between 95,000 and 669,000. Average days on market 119. Mm. Um, of sold properties again in the last six months, uh, two eighty five and one point one million dollars. One point one million dollars was Discovery Harbor closed for nine hundred and fifty thousand. Average days on market seventy two. Mm. So yeah, it's a lot. Um, it's a lot more modestly priced than most any other neighborhoods you're going to find on the island. Mm -hmm. Less some of the areas in Pune. Um, interesting. So I looked at the year to date, you know, sales of residential and land, because I spoke a couple months ago how much land had appreciated. So looking at land last year, uh, we sold 71 parcels of land, median price point. I'm sorry, 2023, 54 parcels of land sold for a total volume of $1.992 million. 
19250 was the average price point of a parcel of land in Kau. So compare that with 2024, 71 sales. So sales are up. Mm-hmm. Volume is much higher, 3890000 mm. Prices are significantly higher, $26,900. So a fairly big increase in land prices over 2023. Yeah. Comparing that to residential, because in 2023, the average price point for a home was $354,000. And in 2024, it's $280,000. So we had a much higher volume in 2023 than we did in 2024. Yeah. You know, 9.5 million versus 8.6 million. So land, we're selling more land at a higher price than we are residents. So um, since you've talked to some of these people, are people buying this land to basically park their money in real estate on Hawaii Island? Or are they actually thinking they're going to build something on it right away? Well, some people think they're going to build on it right away, but... I sold two acres and the guy actually built. Hmm. Um, I sold 12 parcels to a guy, I don't know, a year and a half ago. He actually built on one of them. And I've there's one around the corner that I sold. They were going to move here from Honolulu and build. They didn't. Hmm. Um, and then a couple that I sold last year, an acre of land, they were going to build. They didn't. I actually sold them a house. They already moved into it in uh, Hawaiian Shores Recreational States on the east side. Because then we could have a house. Like, okay. Building is just too hard, you know. Yeah, yeah. That's I, that's, I, that's that's what you know. Andy's trying to impart on a lot of people that I get phone calls from people saying, "I'm going to get a piece of land and I'm going to build a house. I'm going to live in Hawaii," and it's it's harder than you think. It is harder, you know. Particularly if they say, "Hey, I want to build with a permit," or they want to build unpermitted. Well, let me tell you what that really means, you know. Yeah. Building with a permit, you know, it, it is a longer process. I have someone that's getting ready to close. On an oceanfront property in Mililii, they pay cash for the land and they're going to build with permits. They're just starting the process. It'll probably be a year. Mm. And uh, insurance in that neighborhood, they have to carry home. They have to carry hurricane insurance because it's right on the water. Mm-hmm. It's going to be it's going to be expensive. It's in a lava zone two neighborhood. Oh, so you get both. <laughs> so homeowners insurance, like I'm in a lava zone two, all of Kau, pretty much everywhere until you get down to the South Point area, Discovery Harbor. That's Lava Zone 6, Lava Zone 3 and Lava Zone 6. So you can get reasonably priced homeowner insurance. You can get, you know, all lenders will loan out there. Mm -hmm. But pretty much until you get, you know, just shy of an hour out out of Kona, you hit Lava Zone 2 neighborhoods. And so you're Lava Zone 2 all the way down the coast until you get to the very bottom. Mm -hmm. So homeowner's insurance is expensive. Not all lenders will loan. Right, right. So do you see people just saying, screw it, I'll just take my chances and not have any insurance on their property? Oh, yeah. So it was interesting. So I closed a property in Leilani Estates two months ago. Yeah. They paid they paid asking four hundred and seventy thousand dollars. Well, it was four seventy four. They paid four seventy. They leveraged their California property, took cash out of it so they wouldn't carry insurance in Leilani Estates because the quote they got was twelve thousand dollars. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Have, yeah. And that's yeah, another thing, so. too, that uh, one of the reasons we do these uh, updates, too, is that uh, for people coming in, maybe not having seen a lot of these in the past, is to show you that um, buying a house or being buying a piece of land in Hawaii is a different animal than buying, let's say, Kansas. I mean, statistically, insurance in Hawaii is cheaper than, saying, insuring a similar property in California. Yeah, yeah. Well, they get the wildfires and the hur- you know, oh, the earthquakes. So. Right. But then you start factoring in, well, I'm in lava zone one or I'm in lava zone two or I'm on the waterfront. And so then the homeowner's insurance starts kicking up a little bit higher. But you take a lava zone three neighborhood like HPP, compare that to a similar neighborhood in California, you're going to pay more for, in California than you are going to be in Hawaii. Mm-hmm. Uh, unfortunately, that's sort of created the problem we're in now where all of a sudden we're having these adjustments. Mm-hmm you know, in, in insurance costs, because we're offsetting costs For that, those car- that those carriers have incurred in places like Florida, in places like California, in places like the Midwest that are, you know, either taken a hit in tornadoes or hurricanes on the waterfront. Yep. 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 Okay. And we're going to hold that thought because um, the person who's going to talk to us about mortgages and of being able to obtain a mortgage um, is going to be uh, Travis. So I'm going to switch over to Travis. 
who uh, hopefully brings some uh, happiness here to us. Let's see. Uh, I'm going to put the uh, replace spotlight. There you go. There he is. Give us some good news. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll give you some news. Um, so first of all, just a quick update on rates. Um, we're, we're hovering near the uh, kind of year to date and 52 week lows that we've, uh, you know, touched over the last few weeks. Um, average 30 year fixed conventional right now um, is about 6.5. Um, and, uh, you know, VA FHA is, you know, maybe 5.95. So that's your typical lender, typical borrower situation. Um, that's going to vary by lender and, you know, credit score down payment and property type and use, but that's about where things are mid sixes. Right. Um, what's significant about this is, you know, we are right now about where Fannie Mae predicted rates would be in q1 of 25 so the you know the the kind of decrease in interest rates that we've seen over the last month month and a half um you know kind of leapfrogged over a couple of quarters in terms of the forecast from uh from fannie mae and the mortgage bankers association um we're about a quarter to a half a point lower uh depending on the scenario um, so what's coming up right now, and well, let me talk about what's driving that. So what's driving that is essentially inflation has come down very close to the Fed's target. So the Fed targets 2% annual inflation. Um, inflation, uh, you know, we're getting consistent, uh, you know, consecutive reports from the uh, personal consumption expenditures and the uh, consumer price index. And this shows that inflation is, you know, somewhere around 2.5%. Um, so, you know, the Federal Reserve has a dual mandate. And that is to uh, is, is price control or price stability, which is taming inflation and uh, maximum employment. And so, you know, they've been focused inflation, 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 um, and they've been very data driven. And so now it looks like, you know, maybe inflation is under control. There's been some head fakes from, uh, you know, from the market, uh, but it looks like, you know, they might have finally achieved what they what they are uh, trying to achieve. So now their intent, their attention is kind of turning more towards uh, unemployment, and so unemployment started the year at about three point six percent, which is about a fifty year low, um, and it had been sustaining a sub four uh, percent rate for for quite a long time, uh, and now it's about four point three percent, and so this has the market thinking, okay, well time for them to cut, time for them to ease policy, uh, because when unemployment starts to rise, mm -hmm. it usually doesn't just stop rising. Usually when unemployment starts to rise, it'll rise a little bit and then a lot. And so the market is a little bit spooked. That's why you're seeing rates come down to the point where they are, is because the market is basically saying, if, if the Fed is not asleep at the wheel, they're going to cut rates at the next meeting in September. Um, so... To that end, the the next Fed meeting is uh, over two days in September, September 17th and September 18th. That's when they're going to uh, make their next policy decision as to you know to hold rates steady or to cut. Um, the bond market and the Fed futures market has uh, basically a hundred percent chance that they will cut at least a quarter point, um, and that's bolstered by this week we got the release of the. Uh, meeting minutes of the Fed's last meeting in July. And in the official summary of that meeting, it literally said the vast majority of voting members are in favor of easing policy at the next meeting, and that several members uh, could have been on board with easing of policy in July, meaning they probably wouldn't have unanimous uh, consensus in July to cut, uh, cut rates, but a majority maybe were uh, in favor of that, but it sounds like they're all kind of on the same page for, for September, um, that they're going to deliver a rate cut. Um, I think it'll probably be a quarter point rate cut, uh, or 25 basis points. You might hear it said, there's a lot of people in the market, um, calling for a half a point rate cut, just because they think that the fed is a little bit behind the eight ball on unemployment. Mm -hmm. Bolstering that case is, <laughs> the fact that the Bureau of Labor Statistics, which is what reports, uh, they're the entity that you know releases um, job openings and unemployment and, and things like that. 
Well, this week, um, they yesterday actually they released a revision to um, their annual unemployment figures. Basically, the period of um, April twenty three through March of twenty four that showed that they had um, their reporting was off by about in aggregate eight hundred thousand jobs. Die. So the economy actually created these are not jobs lost. They just it's the economy created about eight hundred thousand fewer jobs than what the the previous reports had had shown. And so, you know, this is the biggest miss uh, since 2009. I wouldn't draw too many parallels to that because that's when jobs were uh, being hemorrhaged from the economy and they just undercounted the loss. This is, in effect, the economy created roughly 170,000 jobs a month versus 240,000 jobs a month. So it's a big miss. It's substantial. It shows that there is more weakness in the in the uh, labor sector than um, than has been understood. Um, all, you know, the, the, the release of that data was also delayed by half an hour. Um, and like analysts at a couple of, uh, wall street firms were able to kind of like get hints at to what it was, it, you know, right before it came out. And that has a lot of people pissed off on wall street and in the bond market. But, um, it, it, it was a big, it was a big, uh, you know, kind of egg on the face, um, uh, report and rollout of that report for the Bureau of Labor Statistics. But, in short, it shows that there's more weakness in the labor market than than we had uh, thought. Um, you know, importantly, I think the economy has still, you know, GDP growth has still been strong. Consumer spending has still been strong. Um, hiring has still been strong, even with, you know, fewer jobs than we all thought that there were. Um, so that's, that's an interesting point. And so... What what I'm going to be watching tomorrow, which is going to be Friday the 23rd of August, is Jerome Powell, Jay Powell, the chairman of the Federal Reserve, uh, is giving a speech at the Fed's uh, annual symposium in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. And so this is a very, um, you know, hotly anticipated thing. You know, they typically don't get too deep into details as to like, here's exactly what we're going to do. But um you know, he's probably going to talk about, you know, generally where he thinks things are in terms of inflation, employment, the Fed's current policy stance. He might drop some hints as to, uh, you know, to the market as to maybe temper expectations, at, you know, towards a quarter point rate cut versus a half a point. But, um, you know, Jerome Powell speaking tomorrow uh, in, in Jackson Hole is going to be significant. It might not move the market at all. A lot of this is baked in, right? Like the bond market fully believes that they will cut by a quarter percent uh, in September and then maybe, you know, somewhere between a half and three quarters more by the end of the year. Um, and so a lot of this is already baked in. I heard Joe talk about that last month mm -hmm. on the update that um, this has been baked in by a lot of mortgage companies and by the bond market, which influences mortgage rates. And so I, and I, I a hundred percent agree with that, but this big, this big miss on the, uh, unemployment numbers could change their thinking a little bit where they might think, you know what, we might need to be a little bit more aggressive on the front end of this um, because we've been, you know, getting data that was undercounting uh, or that was overcounting uh, the number of jobs that the economy was creating while inflation was coming down. Yep. Yep. Wow. Um, so, okay. So then um, I saw in our, uh, in our background, we have a, a real like um message board and somebody had posted the frenzy it was going to start tomorrow because <laughs> they think whatever Jerome Powell says is going to actually like influence how everyone's thinking cheap money's ahead let's jump in the market um now's the time to buy a house uh your thing temper this whole experience until they actually do something in September uh you know I um I my whole thing is like, I, I do think that if somebody is thinking that they are going to buy a house sometime in the near or medium future, there, it does not make sense to, to like wait, wait out Jerome Powell um, and, uh, you know, and try to time the market. Like if they had that level of, you know, like, like market savant expertise, like they wouldn't be borrowing money. Uh, because they would be a billionaire. So uh -huh. I, I would advise people to like, don't try to time the market. If you have a need for housing or like you, you know, the numbers work now, um, go ahead and lock that in. Because if your ideal scenario comes to pass, 
let's say you buy now and then whoops, you know, rates are a quarter percent, you know, nothing, we're not, we're not talking, you know, a point or two points lower by Christmas. We're, you know, we're talking an eighth or a quarter, maybe who knows. Um, but it let's, let's say you buy now and then the ideal scenario comes to pass and rates are lower. Okay. Well, six months in, you can probably refinance. You're already above the fray. If people are scrambling to buy, you're not participating in that. Mm-hmm. You're already in your home. You have it secured. You can refinance into lower rates. You can capture those savings later on. And if we do have falling rates and it does create that frenzy, which I don't, you know, I don't necessarily subscribe to that idea that it's going to create that that kind of a crazy frenzy like we saw in the past. Um, but I do think there will be increased buyer activity. There will be increased listings probably because it's it'll be more palatable to to give up a three and a half or four percent rate for a five and a half percent rate better than a seven Mm -hmm. so if that comes to pass it's it stands to reason that property values will probably go up um a little bit at least and if you lock in your price and and interest rate today and then refinance in six or nine or 12 or 18 months you you know that appreciation is going to your equity right rather than your offer price yeah. And so, uh, you know, I think buying real estate's a, a deeply personal and individual experience for everybody. I don't think that there's too much blanket advice, except that if if it makes sense for you in the in the near future, it probably makes as much sense today, if not more, than it will in six months. Yeah. Okay. That's that's good. Um, and then also, um, let's go back to uh, getting a mortgage uh, with the insurance issue going on. Mm-hmm. Um, are you seeing uninsurableness going on? Or I heard that um, the uh, Josh Green is uh, doing an emergency um, condo insurance experience to try and help people. Um, what's happening in the mortgage industry, knowing that all this is happening? Are, are people just? Are you think you're going to lose fifteen percent of your business because people have uninsurable homes? What do you What do you think? Um, it's 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 definitely uh, it's it's causing turmoil for sure for, for lenders and for homeowners and prospective buyers. Um, the insurance thing is huge. Right. And so, you know, like Janice said earlier, we're, we're seeing insurance premiums go up across the board, um, single family homes. It's not even close to the kind of increases we're seeing with condos. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think a lot of what we see in condos is, you know, there are, there are price increases or premium increases happening, you know, kind of across the board, um, nationwide. Um, and then there are, then there are localized increases that are happening. And so, um, interesting while, like, while we've been on this, I saw an email come through from, from the realtor association, which had some reason, like, like, yeah, from Sue Savio and and insurance associates and those guys, and they do incredible work. And, um, maybe, you know, we can talk about that a little bit more too, but, um, you know, one of the, one of the localized things about, you know, condo ownership here is that, you know, it's nowhere near the size of the market that you have in Texas or California. Um, And a lot of the buildings were built in the seventies or the Mm sixties, and they are close to the shoreline or they are subject to, you know, uh, earthquake or wildfire or whatever. And then, you know, you factor in, I mean, I guess the, the, the short story for people to try to understand, I think, why is this happening is, Property values have gone up on average, what, 40% over the last four years or so, something like that. And the number and dollar amount of insured losses has also gone up dramatically over uh, a longer period of time. But, you know, that's a, you know, if you look at that chart, line is going up and to the right. And so as the value of properties continues to increase and the uh, value of insured losses and the frequency of those events continues to increase, um, insurers and reinsurers are gonna raise their costs until they are bringing in more premium uh, payments than they are paying out in uh, you know casualty losses. Mm-hmm. Um, so on the lending side, yeah, we are having to take a, a closer look at these, um, at these declaration pages um, and at these full insurance policies they are, you know, there are certain things in there about the deductible amounts not exceeding five percent of the uh, total coverage uh, amount for a master policy, which is what covers the, you know, the the exterior and roof and structures and common areas and things like that on a condo project. And then there's things like we have to determine if there's a waiver of subrogation or not in the policy. So you know, you, 
when a lender is getting these insurance policies, it's not we're not just kind of scanning the declaration page most of the time anymore. We're opening up the whole policy and we're hitting control F and putting in waiver of subrogation and other things. And you know, and these policy documents are 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 long. Um, and so yeah, it's it's more fine tooth comb work, um, especially for conventional lending. Um, and someone asked a question this morning in our in our realtor caravan about you know are lenders going through meeting minutes of these associations and so for people watching this you know when you when you buy a condo and you're getting a loan for it your lender has to underwrite you and approve you and and all that stuff we also have to kind of do the same thing with the condo project right um so we're going to look at the um the bylaws and the articles of incorporation and they're going to we're going to look at their answers to a number of questions on a questionnaire here it's called an rr 105c um, and we're going to look at their insurance and in some cases we are going to look in the meeting minute we're going to look at reserve studies and stuff like that. And basically, um, the reason that this is under the microscope is kind of what we're talking about with insurance, but also um, that condo complex in Florida that collapsed a few years ago and it tragically in the middle of the night. And like, I think like 98 people lost their lives. It was hor horrific. Well, there was a lot of deferred maintenance, um, things that were uh, critical repairs that went um, unattended to. And so we are asking for copies of inspections. We're looking at the reserve studies. Reserve studies are, you know, things that talk about like, you know, they'll forecast like what improvements are needed, repairs are needed, how, how, how those are going to cost or like how those are going to affect the budget for the HOA, what they might have to do with special assessments or HOA dues increases. Um, they'll try to forecast insurance increases, things like that. It's, a, it's like a financial modeling tool um, that HOAs have for kind of helping map out their financial future and, and their, and their maintenance future. Um, and so if we see something that doesn't match up in a reserve study and a, in an answer to a questionnaire question about planned repairs or, you know, critical maintenance deferred or, um, HOA dues increases or special assessments, and, and it's not quite lining up. Yeah. We're going to probably dig into those meeting minutes and see what's actually getting discussed at these meetings. All right, so get this. We'll go on that one. Um, it's a it's a duty of anybody who's trying to buy a condo to look at those condos. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, the minutes and stuff, or you know, just the whole package, which is extensive, right? So, yeah. When you guys look at that stuff, when you see red flags, do you share that with the people that are trying to buy the condo, or simply just deny them the ability to buy, have a mortgage for that condo complex? Is there like gap um, in that, or what's the? Yeah, so I I explain it. I try to explain it so that they understand. What happened? You know, we're not being capricious about it. You know, like it's it's not like we don't want to lend you the money um, or, you know, we'll explain what their options might be. And so in some of these cases, we you know, a lot of what I'm talking about, you know, is. For, you know, conventional lending that we're going to do in house, things like that, mm -hmm. um, you know, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac and so forth. Um, there are other options. We can broker things to certain outlets that will do non-warrantable um, or condo tell projects that sometimes have these issues. Mm -hmm. Those those scenarios financially look different. Um, they might require bigger down payments. They might have uh, you know features that you don't see in a conventional loan, like a you know maybe like a prepayment penalty within the first year, two or three. Um, you know things like that. Higher closing costs. Not always, but these can be features of these things. Um, and so if that's an option, I'll definitely go into those details, but I'm, I'm going to explain to the person why we're having that conversation and not just to go, oh, well, Fannie Mae doesn't like it for no good reason. We're going to go with, you know, this other um, option that's going to cost more money. I'm going to say, you know, here's why. And like, this is why that's significant or, you know, you know, uh, you try to help them understand where we're coming from. Yeah, yeah, because that's that's important for them to understand too. Do they do they want to get into that right? Like, right. If I mean, they you're know. kind of like help, helping them maybe dodge a bullet, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you know, because all of a sudden something happens, and then they're gonna say, "Well, what happened here? Oh, I missed that in the meeting minutes that the, everyone was complaining about the fact that uh, the spalling has gotten out of control, <laughs> or you know something, right? Right, right, yeah, yeah, or like the you know the the sewer line replacement was dead in the water and the the contractor absconded with the 50 percent payment up front and, and never returned to do the work you know like those are those are important things to yeah, know yeah, yeah. Um, if you were if you were buying a house um and the lender turned it down because of, they got a hold of the inspection and they were like yeah not this house you would want to know like why not this house mm -hmm. you know like why 
what happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, in fact, uh, real quick, just because um, Eric and I are trying to help somebody buy a condo, um, that he um, didn't understand uh, really what a condo tell was and why that might be a little bit more, you know, hard to get a mortgage in. And mm -hmm. um, can you just tell real people just real quick, what's the difference between a condo and a condo tell? Yeah. So uh, a condo tell, um, I think most of us know what a, what, a, what a condo is, just a condominium. A condo tell is, is a smushing together of uh, a condo and hotel. And so these are projects, kind of projects that we or the, or the lender considers primarily um, like transient accommodation in nature, short-term vacation rental type things, um, a lot of vacation homes. Um, that can, you know, be used for a portion of the year by the owner and then rent it out for short periods of time. Oftentimes there's an on-site manager, sometimes through a resort company like Outrigger or Wyndham. Um, they might have a check-in desk. They might have a, um, uh, you know, like a maid service. Uh, they might not have full kitchens, um, things like that. And so there's a whole, there's a whole litany of characteristics that we look for to determine whether or not a project is a condo hotel or not. Um, and that's a pretty, um, robust lending uh, market. Like there, there's a lot of options for condo tells. Um, some of the local banks we broker to, you know, Bank of Hawaii or First Hawaiian Bank, and then some other uh, lenders that we can broker to that do these kinds of projects. Um, but that's a, that's a um, those you know Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac don't want to lend in those because again they are they they view them as primarily of a, uh, for a commercial purpose. Yeah, um, right. You know, yeah, yeah. Even if somebody wants to occupy it as a primary residence, if it has those characteristics, it's it's not going to pass muster. Yeah, and I heard that uh, in the housing crash of uh, two thousand eight and nine, that the the first thing people did was dump their condo tell hot properties in Hawaii as they're uh, skimming out the uh, the, the properties that. Uh, didn't quite fit the portfolio anymore so that was sure. uh, you know they got left hanging you know hanging on to quite a few condo tells uh in their yeah you know, and they're like oh, mm -hmm. what happened here everyone's throwing real estate back at the banks well who are to start hmm. the ones yeah. that are coming in <laughs> yeah yeah and that's so, why for a lot of those you will see higher minimum down payment requirements 20 or 25 percent 30 percent in some cases um, as the minimum down payment, you'll probably see higher interest rates as well. Mm -hmm. And again, if people are ever wondering, like, why, you know, why would they require so much more down or why is the interest rate so much higher? You know, that's a, the lender's way of of uh, evaluating and, and communicating uh, perceived risk. Yeah. Right. And so a primary residence where somebody's going to live in it is less risky than uh, a second home condo hotel that they're going to use, you know, a couple times a year and then, you know, throw on Airbnb, right? You're going to make your primary residence mortgage payment before you're going to make that one if, yep. if, you know, things really hit the fan. Yep, yep, yep. Okay. Um, so um, thank you, Travis. We appreciate yeah, of course. the information you added today. So I'm going to open this up. I'm going to unspotlight you. Watch this. Boom. And then we're going to go down to the old gallery. Um, so um, I'm wondering if uh, there's anybody uh, in the mix that has any questions for our people. Um, and uh, since, uh, you know, we've gone into like all these different aspects of it, um, I'm going to make sure that I have contact information for the people that are in this, um, uh, you know, gallery of fun here. Um, so that way, if you want, you know, mortgage or real estate, different parts of the, of the uh, island, it's all there. So um, if you guys, again, watch this and you have questions for us, please reach out to individually or you can put it in the comments of this on YouTube and uh, we'll try and get back to you as soon as possible. Um, and thanks to um, our two people here who are watching this live. Hopefully this has been valuable to you. Um, and we plan on bringing this back in... Um, late September. Um, so uh, we'll post uh, information about when we're going to do, if you want to do it live, if you see this uh, again later on our um, uh, 365, I'm buying a home in Hawaii group. And if you want to join that, go to 365hawaiiliving.com um, and uh, you can join the Ohana and get into the group that actually gets to see all the good stuff live. And um, again, uh, thanks for being here, all of these wonderful human beings who are very intelligent. And uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens next month um, because when we meet again, the Fed will have met. So um, jump in. <laughs> okay, you guys, thank you for joining us. Aloha. <laughs>